Hello, South Africa. Denmark calling. This is Lars calling from my home office here in Copenhagen, Denmark. I have the pleasure of being the moderator in this session. I'm very excited to be doing this together with two panel members here. Uh, I have a lot in common with these, uh, this lady and this gentleman, and you will find out very soon uh, how these things connect. Uh, we all have a lot to share about new ways of learning. That's the key theme in these 45 minutes, roughly. Um, both Brenda and Lindsay here have a, a very purposeful path in life that brought them here today to share <clears throat> about new ways of learning with us today. And I really encourage uh, both of them, but also everybody on this session here, whether you're on the uh, on, on the camp um, stream or on YouTube, I want you to engage in this conversation, get yourself involved, ask questions, throw in comments, anything you feel like, please engage in the conversation because this is a very important topic, new ways of learning. And we are going to discuss why that is and what we can really do uh, to faster new ways of, of learning. <clears throat> Now, before I introduce uh, our fantastic panel members here, I just want to be uh, not very polite and just quickly introduce myself as your moderator first. <laughs> and then, then we can get that out of the way and, and get to what is really important here. So it's, it's just for context. So I, I really come uh, with a really nerdy educational background as an electronics engineer. I've had corporate careers. Uh, in technical roles, business management, leadership roles, in life science, fintech, environmental tech, educational tech, in Fortune 500s, in SMEs, uh, and other interesting types of organizations. But I always gravitated around what seems to be my natural role as a social tech entrepreneur, uh, especially in the past 15 years where I've been founding, uh, for example, Educate for Life. It's a global virtual community of practice that works to design new paradigms for education. So what you hear from me is probably going to be an outside in perspective on, on things. <clears throat> so, but that's enough about me. Uh, and, uh, and I really want you to get to meet uh, two uh, fantastic people here who, who they are doing things. They are making things happen. They are change agents. And I want to say ladies first. So I would like Lindsay to go first. Uh, Lindsay, why don't you give us an introduction to what it is you do and very importantly, why you're doing it? Sure, thank you, Lars. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, if you happen to be watching in a part of the world where it's not uh, morning. Uh, it is wonderful to be here with you. My name is Lindsay Westner, and I am the Chief Ed Imagineer of Teach, Learn, Innovate. So uh, if you just did a double take and said, uh, what did she say? Uh, you wouldn't be wrong in that I, I, I did just uh, describe myself using a made-up title. Um, that's one of the fun things about being your own boss is you get to make up your own uh, own titles. So, um, there are not that many other fun things, <laughs> but that's one of them. So um, I call myself an Edu Imagineer because I believe that education can and should be better, not just for our children, but also for teachers. So you might hear the word imagine or magic in there. Um, I am very much a dreamer and a believer, but I'm not just a dreamer and a believer. I also believe in uh, in uh, in doing the hard work and in, in acting where the rubber meets the road. So uh, the engineering part or the architecting part is uh, where I help teachers and students all around the world um, and in South Africa engineer and design learning differently. So um, that is my life's work and my and my passion. And uh, we do that through Teach Learn Innovate which is an organization of like-minded uh, Ed Imagineers. So why I do what I do uh, is a little bit of a, a story. I was once upon a time a teacher 
very traditional teacher talk and talk worksheet after worksheet. Essentially, I just taught the way that I had been taught. Um, I think most most teachers kind of default to that. It's a very, very common occurrence. And uh, all was well in my teaching career until uh, one day I got a job at a very progressive school and uh, walked into a classroom where all of the children took out their laptops and looked at me. And at that stage, my tech skills extended to being able to send a BBM and put marks on an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and so I was uh, utterly petrified, to say the least. But uh, in that moment, I had a, a crisis of conscience because I suddenly realized that as a teacher my whole life, what I'd been doing was being a fountain of knowledge and information um, and that I hadn't been what I now call teachers, which is a learning architect. And uh, I realized suddenly that as the students were sitting in front of me with information at their fingertips, they didn't need information from me. And so I began to ask myself, well, what do they need? And what is my role as a teacher? And in, in doing so, I discovered that actually my role is a little bit more like being a learning architect. And so I've been on an interesting journey, both in my own classroom, um, working for uh, tech companies, helping teachers in the adoption of technology for teaching and learning. And for me, technology was the catalyst, but I don't believe that it's uh, the, the solution in its entirety. Um, so now my life's work is at the intersection of education and technology, and then the very core uh, human ingredients of, of passion and empathy, trying to figure out new ways to design learning. So I know the topic of this uh, is new ways to deliver learning, but I feel like actually architecting or designing learning is a far more progressive view of, uh, of what it is that, that I do and that teachers in, uh, in this day and age can and should be doing. So yeah, I hope that's an, enough of an intro. Let me know if you have any other questions, but I'm sure we'd love to hear from Brent. We'll get to them, Lindsay. That was a, a really useful uh, and great introduction. Uh, I immediately knew when we prepared for this that the subtitle of our session here would cause us some good debates or give some good debates, which is um, new ways of learning, uh, new ways to deliver learning. Uh, and do we actually deliver learning? Is that a push or is it a pull? Or what is that about? So Lindsay immediately jumped right at it. Um, Excellent. Uh, we'll get back to you, uh, Lindsay. Uh, but before we do that, over to Brent here. Brent, why is it really that you're leading an organization called Care for Education? What's your purpose? What, who is Brent, by the way? Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Lindsay, really enjoyed your introduction. Um, uh, I'm also a teacher, uh, you know, in the past and uh, it's quite often when I say to people, uh, we, we often put the word in South Africa, we put the word just, you know, I was, I'm just a teacher, but, uh, but it, it's so far from the truth. I mean, I think teachers are, are potentially, you know, the, the greatest asset that we have in this country and, and something that we have to invest so much in. And so, so I'm driven to make a difference in, in that space. And I started a nonprofit organization about 10 years ago uh, we partners with the Lego Foundation, uh, and that enables us to provide free resources, uh, learning through play resources and training um, to ECD schools, uh, organizations in need, uh, and disadvantaged communities or under-resourced communities. Um, and, uh, and I work with a group of teachers here, so really passionate, like Lindsay, passionate people trying to make a difference, uh, trying to come up with a you know, a solution that is practical and that can be implemented by our country. And uh, we believe that that learning should take place um, through construction rather than instruction. You know, that we want to see more manipulatives or tactile tools um, used, um, not only to stimulate the children, but to encourage the learners um, so that um, we can greatly accelerate the conceptualization process and, and allow children to become more inventive, curious, creative. Uh, so very similar to the to the route that that Lindsay's taken, and um, uh, and and I think we're trying to do very similar things, and I guess very similar to what you're doing as well. Uh, and yes, I'm really excited today to to you know to debate this whole delivery you know idea and concept uh, in terms of you know what what the future of learning will look like, um, and why. You know, why, why is this so important to me, you know, other than the fact that I, I really believe teachers need to be supported? Um, I, I have a, 
you know, we, we live in a country where we have, uh, you know, a, a large number of children that are going to schools that are not that um, exciting and, and learning is difficult for them. And, and it's not only difficult for the teachers, but it's extremely difficult for the children. They come from circumstances that, are, that make learning really tough. And, and I really believe that we have a responsibility to try and lessen the load on them and just make it a little bit more fun, a little bit more engaging. Um, and so that's, that's really, you know, what gets me up every single day and makes me work as hard as I do. Thank you. Uh, an equally exciting introduction, Bren. Uh, and I can feel the passion from both of you uh, around this topic. Uh, one of one of the most important things for me is first of all to understand why do we really need to care about finding new ways of learning and, and Brent touched uh, you both touched a little bit on it uh, but could, couldn't we continue the way we have been learning um, I just wanted to say also we already established especially Lindsay established the connection between learning and education in the introduction uh, <clears throat> so it makes a lot of sense with you both coming from an educational uh, educator background um, but inside outside of the education system why is it important that we care about new ways of learning Lindsay do you want to go first sure so uh, I think I'll, I'll answer that with the question and the, the question is where in the world today, as we know it, does anybody get a new work environment, a new team, a new project, uh, and a new team leader every 50 minutes to an hour? Um, and I'm hoping that the answer is nowhere. Um, <laughs> but that for me really, in essence, is what our current school system looks like. Our students move from subject to subject in the timetable that is regimented and divided. And essentially for them, never mind the social shift, the cognitive shift every hour or however long the lesson periods end up being, um, it's just such a contrived environment, right? There is nowhere in the real world where you're getting new projects, new dynamics, new teams, new, new things thrown at you uh, every 50 minutes. And I think that they, that there is that disconnectedness um, within the way the school timetable itself is structured. That is part of the um, part of the thing, part of the elements that we need to that we need to look at, right? If we want to understand that learning um, is in essence part of the real world, right, and uh, it, it's part of life. It doesn't stop and start at, at certain points, right? We know that. But the thing is, if we are if we are designing education in order to prepare children for the real world or the world beyond the classroom, rather, um, then surely the classroom needs to start to mirror that. Surely we cannot have um, subjects in silos, even. So, where. Uh, when, we, when we're in our jobs and we're in our work and we encounter a problem or a challenge, we don't sit and say, okay, let me just think about what I learned in English. That's going to help me solve this problem, right? We address issues in an integrated way. There isn't a science component and a maths component and separate areas of our brain that deal with, deal with separate subjects, right? Everything is integrated and everything is, is applied. And I think that's one of the challenges where, uh, like Brent said, for students, school is not fun, it's not pleasant. Um, and there are a number of different reasons for that. You know, of course, we've got socioeconomic factors, but then even just in the way the system is designed, the learning is designed, there's a disconnect between realness and meaning in the way learning is designed and realness as we know it in the world beyond, uh, beyond the classroom, right? So I think one of the things that we certainly need to start looking at is how can we architect learning within the box, right? So people think about innovation in, uh, being thinking outside of the box. Um, my favorite definition of innovation is Jamie Notters, and he says, innovation is change that unlocks new value. 
So I think why we need to why we need to look at the system as it is is because there's that disconnect, and how we need to look at it is to start innovating inside the box. What can we do within that structure that starts to move us to a far more real and relevant and meaningful learning experience? Thank you, Lindsay. Before I hand over to Brent to answer the same question, we just have a comment from Justina, uh, uh, who is uh, on the call. Uh, saying, Lindsay, I love that you'd answer with a question. Uh, and so do I, by the way. Uh, we as architects of learning should ask great questions rather than jump into given answers. Isn't that a good point as well uh, to, to complement what you're saying? Yeah. Brent, over to you. So why do we need to care about new ways of learning? I think I I want to pick up on what Lindsay, Lindsay's already said again, because I, I think it's so it's so pertinent to, to to the discussion today and and I'd, I'd like to just summarize it very quickly in, in in a in a set of paradoxes you know and Lindsay's mentioned them but but very quickly if you just consider the following that um, if you look at uh, learning or learning through play you know to make because we spoke about it being more fun right we want it to be more fun so I I, I personally believe that play is an essential part of that um, and and that's what makes it fun so if you look at the paradoxes between when children learn while they're playing and you look at schools, uh, there's major differences. And let's just, I'll just go through four very quickly for you just to, to make you think about it. But if you think of, you know, Lindsay said, you know, school is timetabled. It's 50 minutes here and then it's a different class. So you have that timetabled, set out, structured layout. And learning is timeless. You know, it can happen anytime, anywhere. Children get sucked in and they lose themselves in that process. So that's a ma massive paradox. Um, you know, schools are places of conformity and order where we want everybody to, to do everything, you know, the same way whenever we need them to do it. Whereas normally when you're learning on your own and in a playful way, it's chaotic, it's messy, it's loud. You know, our classrooms, we want these kids to sit still. And, 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 and so that's a massive paradox. Um, schools are places of safety. If you look at so many schools today, if you go there, all the rules in place to keep children safe, you know, the teachers are like policemen uh, because they're trying to, you know, keep them quiet in the corridors and walking in straight lines. Whereas learning, you know, it, it involves risks. It needs, it needs us to take risks uh, and, and to work out if the risk is worth taking or not worth taking. Um, and, and I guess the big one for me in schools, uh, and this is a difficult one and a debatable one, is, is that the agenda is generally set by adults. Um, and in other types of learning, children are in charge. And, you know, and that's why I think we need to have a look at how you know, education has to change. Those are a couple of simple paradoxes that we could use to help us understand that. Uh, absolutely. I think these are commonly mentioned uh, both by parents, by teachers, and, and yet we keep uh, fighting with these paradoxes for some reason. Um, so let's move into what we can do about this, how we can best turn this around and actually deploy new ways of learning. What are the new ways of learning that we uh, find important to share here? As, as also as inspiration and as call to action. Um, Lindsay, do you want to go first? I don't mind. I just feel like uh, <laughs> maybe we want to give Brent a chance to go first also. <laughs> Otherwise, he's always going to be saying, as Lindsay said, because uh, we share a lot, of, uh, a lot of common visions. We could, so, we could flip um, it around and go with Brent first, actually. That's a, that's, that's a nice dynamic. And... Uh, I, I'll again encourage our uh, lovely audience to uh, engage with us and with questions, with comments. Uh, what, uh, do you see the same paradoxes as Brent has just outlined here? Uh, do you find it important to really change this? And what could be the way to, uh, to, to change these things? So, okay, Brent, uh, let's, let's go on with you. Um, how do we solve for this? What are new ways of learning that has been working, seen from the work you're doing, from your perspective? Yeah, and Lars, I, I think it's also important here that um, I know you have a slightly different perspective and might come from a slightly different angle. And it'd be great if we give you an opportunity to jump in as well. And so that you're not only having to host us because you, you are meant to be a speaker. So please also... 
also take the floor and, and, and jump in with your comments. I think we'd love to hear from you as well, especially with your experience, which is so, let's say, different to both Lindsay's and, and, and mine. But, um, you know, I, I think a lot of work that I do, you know, and we, we work with a lot of amazing people, you know, from teachers right up to thought leaders and companies that are trying to make a difference. And I think the real, the real challenge is, is, is getting practice uh, to, to follow the kind of thinking that, that, that people come up with. So what I call pie in the sky kind of thinking, like what sounds really great and interesting and exciting to what really happens in the classroom. That's the real difficulty. And, and that I think is the biggest stumbling block. It's a, it's a massive uh, stumbling block. And, and to get that to work, um, requires a, an, an enormous amount of effort. Um, it, it means that you have to work with teachers. It means that you have to get teachers to, to first of all, trust and believe uh, in the processes that you would like to see changed. Um, and then you have to work with them, you know, and, and more importantly, you have to go through a process of reflection with them where they're able to tell you how they're feeling, to voice their frustrations, um, because in reality, it's so much easier to go back to what you knew or back to, you know, uh, how you were taught. Um, and, and, and that's a constant struggle. So I think uh, going forward, it's, it's finding a way to be able to, to get to these teachers. Because if you think of the logistic difficulty of doing that, you know, with so many teachers uh, under so much pressure, how do, you, how do you get time to be with those teachers? And, and I, I would say that there are two ways that we can we can you know help in the future, the, and they they juxtaposition perhaps to each other. The one is that you use technology, so technology obviously has to play a major role in the futures. So modern technology, in other words, um, uh, great courses, MOOCs, online courses, training that people can do, listening to the best professors, the best minds, you know, talking about change and whatever. That's one way. So that's at the high end. So using technology. But then the one that I think which is quite intriguing, which is the role of every single teacher is simplicity. It's the complete opposite. Is how do we make things so simple that if we implement something, everybody understands it and can get benefit out of it, but it must still make the same difference that the high-end technology makes. So for me, I would say, I think the future is, is two of both of those, uh, high-end technology and very simple ideas that make a massive difference. Makes perfect sense. Uh, Lindsay, you are unmuting. So before before I jump to the table, <laughs> do you want to go next? <laughs> I'm happy to. Um, I think one of the uh, one of the one of the, the the key questions that we're really asking is if we understand the why we need to change, then uh, then then it's really looking at the how. You know what what do we do? Um, and I absolutely agree with Brent. Um, in terms of the role of technology, especially in uh, in giving teachers independence and being able to drive their own learning um, as educators and and to continue continue in their professional development, I think uh, one of the things that I'm particularly passionate about because I work primarily with with teachers and with school leaders is that when we have teacher learning experiences, um, I don't call them training sessions or workshops, uh, you'll notice my language is very important to me, but when we, when we offer teacher learning experiences, I think one of the key things is that when we do that, we model the pedagogies and the ways of des designing learning that we're trying to, to promote. So um, I definitely think that the future of, of education involves a far more problem-based and inquiry-based approach to education. If you look at the characteristics of Generation Z, who are the students in, in our classrooms at the moment, or even if it's virtual classrooms from their homes, uh, those are the students that are in the education system at the moment. And actually, if you look at the research on Generation Z and how they think and how they operate, I mean, they were the first generation to be born um, where a world without technology is just, you know, it doesn't make sense to them, right? They, um, they've been surrounded by technology from, from the beginning. But if you look at the, the, the research, it'll tell you that actually the children in our class today are exceptionally curious. They're exceptionally compassionate. And they're not just children who want to solve problems. They're children that when you connect them to problems, um, they actually 
problem finders. So they love connecting to, to problems that really matter to them. And when they do, then um, that's where the incredible, incredible learning happens. So I certainly think that as part of um, our approaches to how do we power teachers, we need to think about modeling those kinds of uh, pedagogies with, with teachers. So I actually have a little visual that I, that I wanted to share with you, uh, just to give you an idea of, of something practical and tangible that can be done. Because I know when I work with teachers, they love their subjects, they love the content of their subjects, and they are very confident in saying, you know, I know how to teach the subject, and they're passionate about their subject for the most part. But as I mentioned earlier, the world does not operate in curricular silos. The world is cross-curricular and the world is, um, is integrated. So um, if the guys backstage could just, uh, pop the visual up there, then that would be great. So what it's you see right here, there. there we go, lots of color. Uh, what you're seeing here is an example of hexagonal thinking, which is a strategy that we used for cross-curricular inquiry-based learning design. And uh, actually what you're seeing here is the initial stages of that process where each of those hexagons represents a different subject. So they have begun with the curriculum. I always find that that's a great place to start with teachers because that's what's familiar to them and it's what's known and a lot of the time it's what's expected. So they've got little pieces of the curriculum um, mapped out and what they've done here is try to find connections. And it's incredible actually when you pull the curriculum apart and you get a little bit unstuck in your thinking, how we start to see things differently, right? And how we're able to put together those, um, those pieces differently. And what we, uh, what we do next in the process is uh, to aim towards designing something that is based on a problem, right? Um, or a question. So rather than the traditional kind of worksheet, if we were learning about nutrition and food, uh, healthy or not healthy, uh, what you're seeing over here is the end product of teachers who have spent some time together designing an inquiry-based learning unit around, are sandwiches the superfood of the future? So in this particular unit, the students were actually investigating the nutritional value of sandwiches, understanding superfoods, using language to market their, their superfood, conducting investigations, doing data handling, uh, looking at the history of, uh, of food and food production. So there's science in there, there's maths in there, there's language in there. Um, what they then had to do was actually to create their own new superfood and present that superfood to a kind of Dragon's Den style uh, panel of investors to see which, which superfood would get sponsored to, um, to be uh, shared with those in in and um, disadvantaged environments where malnutrition is rife. So here we have students, and this was a, a grade four project. So we're not talking about particularly, uh, you know, uh, old students, they're, 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 they're littlies, um, but we're designing learning in such a way that we're bringing together subjects, connecting students to real world problems. And the beautiful part about this is that we can still cover the curriculum. So if you, uh, I'll just give you a little behind the scenes here into what it looks like in, uh, in, in a sort of sped up version, right? So thinking about what pieces of the curriculum, what student-centered learning is gonna happen at which stage in the process. Um, and it is actually possible to build these kinds of units to cover curricula um, for an entire term even. Uh, and I think that it's really exciting when we start to involve teachers in this process. It's one thing to issue a nicely designed uh, cross-curricular unit, but when teachers start to take ownership of the process, it's, it's really exciting. Um, this is another example where the driving question was, are the keys to a better nation hidden in creation? And this was looking at leadership structures in nature and animals um, and what we as a society can learn from nature and how we might use that to build on and improve society. And this particular unit covered all of the content for one term for grade five learners. So I think that for me, it's really around engaging teachers. If we want learning to be engaging, we want to model that kind of learning. We want to engage them in those kinds of experiences. Um, and then we can really connect the teachers to the problem, which is 
how might we design learning in a way that is meaningful and relevant? And in, and in taking teachers through that kind of learning journey and getting them to experience, grappling with the problem, putting the pieces together. So we then empower them to be able to design that kind of learning for, for their students. It's pretty exciting stuff, I think. It, it is a very actionable, yeah. So, so this is this is something every teacher can 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 do uh, with, with your guidance. Seems very practical, very uh, straightforward to do. What's what's your experience from implementing this? Uh, is 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 that relatively seamless, or how has it so, been working? Yeah, it's it's certainly a massive shift. Right, so to shift from a teacher-centered learning environment to a student-centered uh, learning environment is a, is a real challenge. I think from my own experience, when I first did this in my own classroom, I don't just take people down a, a rabbit hole that I haven't been down before myself, but I remember grappling with the, what is my role? What is my job? You know, I'd come to the classroom and, and the students would be working in their groups and they're investigating and I've designed these tasks for them. And I'd kind of feel a little bit useless in the beginning, to be honest. But what I then realized is actually this gives me, this kind of learning design gives me the opportunity to come alongside my students, to converse with them, to have discussions, to connect with them, to get to know them better and to, to be much more of a coach. I think I always struggled with that one size fits all kind of teaching. You, everybody does it. You teach to the middle. We can't really extend um, and enrich the students at the top of the spectrum and the ones that need um, need some more support and enrichment and and, uh, and assistance. We can't give that to them. So I think for me, there was a joy in discovering that in my classroom. Uh, the teachers that I've worked with, I mean, we've worked with uh, developing over a hundred of these cross curricular units based on. South African CAPS curriculum um, across the country. And uh, what commonly happens is I get an email saying, so Lindsay, I'm trying to come up with the next question for my next inquiry-based learning unit. Can you help me? Um, because once you discover the joy, and there is a lot of struggle, it's an adjustment, it's a change, it's a process, it takes time. I'm not saying that it's seamless by any stretch, but what I what I realize is that teachers fall in love with being a learning architect because they start to see the the results. And these are not just academic results, right? They're, they're results of developing character and growth mindset and, and being able to teach beyond the curriculum and connecting our students to problems that they want to solve and them finding actually you know what i'm really passionate about i'm really passionate about this thing which then of course makes subject choice and those kinds of things so much easier in in the long run so in essence it is a struggle it's an adjustment but uh once once they're in love with uh, with inquiry based and project based learning and design thinking as a way of teaching uh, a lot of teachers find it very difficult to go back because they just see how it unlocks new meaning um, and so many so many more results than um, that you would get in a, in a traditional way of teaching. Plus, you can still tick the boxes. You can embed assignments in there that can fill the mark sheets. So um, it's a it's a wonderful journey to be on. And I think it's it's a journey, right? We 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 get better at designing, and and it is that mindset in the bit that you mentioned in the beginning, Lars, that reflexivity, that that flexibility, and um, that is, and Brent mentioned it too. That is a it is a struggle, but it's such an essential um, skill in a teacher toolbox. Excellent, Lindsay. Um, and, and there are so many touch points here from you, Brent, and from you, Lindsay, that I, 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 I want to connect to them. I, I'll try to do it briefly, but let me tell you a story. I'll tell you my story. I'll try to condense it and touch on, uh, on what is essential for the conversation here. I just wanted to add, Lindsay, also maybe trust the students uh, is something that is very exciting once once you do it, you, you just see, hey, it works. If you trust people, they can feel it and they just do better and they get more excited about things. Don't we feel the same way? Uh, it's probably the same for, for, for students, I would argue. Uh, just to add to this wonderful list of simple and important points, <clears throat> uh, let me give you, so you are both uh, working inside of the education system. You both have educators' backgrounds, and and what what you're doing here seems very uh, tangible, implementable. 
I just want to give a different perspective coming from the outside looking in on the education system. Uh, I already mentioned my, my background. Uh, I just see that, okay, you're moving. So I'm, I'm still uh, live here. Great. Um, I just want to say that um, my story really, uh, I was super bored throughout school. It was so boring uh, until I got to university. I got to do what I was excited about, where that was math, it was electronics, it was science. Uh, that was fantastic. Then life started for me. When I became a dad, and that was uh, 10 years ago, now I have two boys, the eight and 10. That triggered something for me because now I had apologies. Uh, I don't mean to offend anybody in the education system. I had to work with the education system again, and I had left it behind me. Uh, and finally, I got my life back. I could do what really was important for me to do. Now my kids were going through the same thing. They were uh, burned out in, within one, two years of starting uh, in elementary school. They were bored out of their minds. Uh, but there was another issue. My now 10-year-old boy got diagnosed with autism, a type of autism and ADHD. And that explained clearly why he couldn't take a long series of instructions from a teacher, in particular in a noisy school environment where, with smell uh, and a sensory overload in general. He had to lock himself in the, in the school uh, toilet. That was the only quiet place. Now, fast forward, I started to, to, to learn about how do we leave, uh, live with, with with these diagnoses and these challenges, uh, being a great learner as he is. But I discovered thousands, literally personally, I discovered thousands of families in the same situation. They couldn't use the education system. There were no offerings. There, were, there was no help. There was no understanding. This is just to say that I discovered that there's a category of us called non-neurotypical learners. This is just to add to the conversation already. It turns out this is a quarter of the global population. Uh, one fourth of the global population will probably struggle even to go to school, even they're great learners. So there, that is for me another reason to find new ways of learning. And that makes me passionate about it because I can tell so many people cannot even use the educational offerings that 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 we have not there's still 250 million children without access to basic schooling that is a problem as well and that requires solutions to new ways of learning so i essentially started my community educate for life to bring together people who are passionate about this topic and out of that has come a number of different initiatives recently Planet Pilot, which is really to trust the kids in their uh, personal learning journey. Leave the learning to the kids. L let them be fully empowered. Uh, you've got to give them some technology because that's how we work today, especially with COVID-19 lockdowns. We, we are trapped at home, whether we like it or not. Some of us love being at home all the time. <laughs> we certainly don't have any intention of going out unless we have to. So technology, which Brent mentions, is a very key part, I, being, I believe, to the future of learning. So we can get connected. So my kids can work with uh, amazing kids from South Africa and from everywhere else on the planet, build relations rather than see cultures as something strange and, and, and co-create, co-ideate, learn together. So that part in itself is just such a game changer. <clears throat> Uh, by the way, uh, Lego's uh, Lego Foundation CEO um, stated clearly, and I, I agree, I think many agree, that there is really no coming back to the pre-COVID situation. I think we need new way, ways of learning and also new ways uh, of, of, of uh, you know, working with education. Uh, whether we like it or not, whether we like to fall back to our default comfort zone, how we were trained, I think we have to get out of that comfort zone and embrace 
the new tools, the new ways of learning, because there are millions and millions out there who can never access the wonderful learning that each teacher has to share. Um, so that, that's just to, to, to mention a little bit of, of my approach, which is not really at all related to education, but very much related to learning. Because my son, he is an excellent learner. Uh, and he just needs to learn by himself. And his, uh, and YouTube is a, is a very important tool for him. I don't approve of everything he learns from YouTube, but but he, he uses it and he learns a lot of great stuff. He He's fluent in English because of just watching YouTube, essentially. Um, so trust the students, engage with students. Those should be pretty simple things, I would say, right? <laughs> uh, but it's not because we were programmed to, to teach and to tell, tell others what they need to learn, when they need to learn it. So this is a paradigm shift that, that is what I'm here to, uh, to build uh, uh, from the outside. We started working with families uh, and saying, hey, uh, we love teachers. I personally grew up with a lot of amazing teachers around me. I loved them. Uh, but they don't like to change the, the ones I've met so far, with some exceptions. And uh, so the parents... Uh, are, are the years are the same, Lars. Yeah, yeah, parents are worse, I can tell you. Uh, that's my next thing. Parents are, are the biggest system for learning. Go do your homework, right? Uh, and you have to get ready for school. As a matter of fact, I pulled my kids out of school and it triggered an immune system from society, I can tell you. That's not being a responsible parent, right? Uh, so we as adults are the immune system and we are the ones really who need to change. The kids are doing just fine. Uh, so uh, I, I just wanna get back to, um, to really look forward here. The, the next steps for educators, for parents, because I don't see this as an education only paradigm shift. I see it as a, as a global joint learning project, uh, a paradigm shift for, for learning uh, and for allowing our kids to learn differently. So what would be the most important call to action that we can share with our audience here today in the last four minutes that, that we have left of our session. What's the most important thing we can leave as a call to action with anybody out there who wanna go first? I can go. Lars, I'm happy to go. Um, uh, always leave the last comment to Lindsay, I've learned that. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I, th I would say for me, uh, you know, and, and touching on what you just said about the role of parents, if you think about COVID-19 and the lockdown around the world, I think parents have very quickly started to understand the role teachers play. Uh, and they very, very quickly understood what their own children are like as learners and that not all of the children learn in the same way. So they're learning things very, very quickly at the moment and they're going through the similar process that you're going through. But I think they play an important role, not as educators, I think they play an important role going forward to support educators and support education systems to make this very fundamental change. And that is to focus on process. Allow teachers and schools to focus on process and stop worrying about the end result. Only the parents can do that for us. And the parents have to back that and they have to support that and they have to allow education systems to uh, work with their children and spend time on process. The end results will take care of themselves if the process is fixed. And I would say that's my biggest call to action. Excellent. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I love the word that you said, stop obsessing with the results, because my, my call to action was going to be a little bit uh, MC Hammer-esque. Um, and I was going to ask you to stop, collaborate, and listen. So I think my, my call to action would definitely be um, stop accepting that the status quo is the best way. Um, and along with that, I think a lot of the time the school system and teachers feel pressure from the outside where parents are saying, but metric results, but I want to see the numbers on the page, but the, where's the homework in their books, but, but, but. And I understand where it's coming from, but I think we do need to stop um, and reassess 
what is happening um, and question, then I think uh, definitely on the collaboration front, I would like to see teachers collaborating more. Um, I think that a lot of the time, one of the beautiful things about technology is that it allows us, as Lars mentioned, to connect. But uh, I think teachers feel very pressured to develop innovative means and innovative strategies, but they feel often that they're in isolation. So uh, one of the communities that I started is hashtag ZAEDU, which is a community of South African teachers. But I think definitely um, a lot of the time teachers say, I don't have time to innovate, but then they're doing exactly the same thing that a teacher in a corridor down the road or at a school down the road is doing. So I think definitely connecting um, teachers and connecting as a community would, would be part of my call to action. And then finally, listen. Listen to what the students are saying. Look at how students learn. Students love games. Why do they love games? Well, because I get second chances. There's always a level up. I'm an avatar. I don't have a label on me as that kid who can't do maths. Um, I can receive heraldry and acknowledgement, you know. So um, even just stopping and listening and paying careful attention to how children do learn when you've seen them learning in your homes as parents, listen to that and, and lean into that. Because I think that in in doing so and in truly listening to where our kids are at, we can start to figure out how to reconstruct and build uh, a better way forward for sure. Thank you very much, Lindsay. I, I think I'll uh, close with, with my call to action then, given we are at the end of, of the session here. It would be how we all measure success how we see successful learning and and education because and i want to end on a very positive note by the way about educators <laughs> I, I like to be thought provoking because this is important changing is so critical crucial now but um but teachers are doing what they do out of love passion they're working super hard they're doing great things. We couldn't live without teachers and parents realized that during the COVID-19 lockdown. But every lesson is being measured. What do we need to accomplish by when all these things? And if we don't do what we are being asked to do in terms of teaching, we struggle maybe to meet the expectations of the education delivered. That's a challenge. I think from a parent's side, we struggle um, maybe similarly with We've been programmed with you know, success is at least just getting your child to school so it can get a good education, so it can get a good career, earn good money and have a good life. But uh, life is going to be different. Um, and we'll see in the, in the coming years here. I hope we can find better ways of measuring what success looks like when it comes to new ways of learning. With that, we are at the end of uh, the allocated session here. Uh, Lindsay, Brent, everybody out there, it's been such a pleasure to uh, play together here. Uh, and I look forward to, I'm sure, do a lot of exciting things together. Everybody in South Africa is invited, by the way. So let's change the way uh, we learn. So uh, thank you for now, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks. Goodbye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Keep fighting the good.